Welcome back to a brand new Civ 6 or Civilization 6 video. Hope you're all having fantastic days. But one of the most important things in Civ 6 is, of course, learning where to settle cities. Learning how to settle them, and especially learning not to get yourself locked off by the enemy AI who decided to launch five cities right beside your capital. Now, if you settle in a bad location in Civilization 6, the next thing you know, you're like the free folk from Game of Thrones, roaming the lands doing jack-all while Germany just built the Exoplanet Expedition and decided to launch an expedition against your sticks and stones looking ass with high-grade military equipment, pretty much recreating the scramble for Africa. Now, in order to get those nice, juicy, thick cities for that Reddit karma, making you feel like you mean something in this world, you're going to want to learn exactly how to place them, when to place them, and exactly what constitutes a good city. You get locked into a bad spot, you're done. It's over. You might as well beg Big Daddy Montezuma to put you out of your misery while you still can. This will go a long way towards winning your games on Deity, where even the most godly players fall short from time to time. Learning how to settle the optimal cities will easily give you an unsurmountable advantage. And without further ado, let's get started with the top 6 settling mistakes everybody makes. We're going to jump right into the deep end with this first juicy mistake we all make, food overproduction. Now, people need to eat, right? We live in a society where food is never in shortage, shortage and you can eat as much as you want whenever you want without having to worry about famine or starvation in most of the world. I say screw that. In Civ 6, you get almost no bonuses for high population unless you want to build more districts. Now you might be saying, but if I have a higher population, I'm going to have more production. Well, no, that's not really the case, because in order to get a high population, you're going to need to settle near a lot of food. And that's the problem. The more food tiles there are, the less mines and lumber mills there will potentially be for you to increase production. You can call me Queen Victoria because no food is coming to help a starving famine in my territory. You get a certain amount of population and that's it. To the mines you go. I don't care if you're a man, woman, child, I don't discriminate. All seven of my city's population is working lumber mills or mines or gold, whatever I need in that specific moment. Hey, don't care what era it is, I don't discriminate based on sex or race. You're all going to work for me. Gotta get that musket man out because Alexander's looking at me like a full course chicken dinner. You all get no food when it comes to growth. Production is also harder to come by. You could always get granaries or water mills or stuff like that, aqueducts, to increase your housing and eventually increase the amount of growth you can get. But without mines and lumber mills, aside from industrial zones and the Ruhr Valley, you're really not going to be getting a lot of potential production out of buildings or out of just, you know, just districts you build for the most part. Not to mention Ruhr Valley giving production from mines. If you need more districts and food, trade routes are always an option to give you extra food. But a lot of the times, more production is better than growth, allowing you to build everything you want from districts to spaceship parts and too much population and you really will not be able to get anything done. Not only for the negative amenities, because negative 10% for being in the negatives when it comes to amenities is a lot. And if you don't have higher population, you don't need to build entertainment complexes everywhere, which means another free district slot you can use on campuses, commercial hubs, or whatever. Now, food does have limited positives, being that you need population to get the next district, but in all likelihood, if you're going for a science victory, you don't need more than campuses, commercial hubs, and industrial zones in most circumstances. That's no more than 7 population. 11 if you really want to get maybe the government plaza in your capital city or something. But aside from that, you really don't need a high population. Sending everyone to work in the mines for the most part is going to give you the most production possible. Now, just to reiterate, I'm not saying food in the most part is a bad thing. I'm saying that if you have to choose between a place with higher food versus higher higher production, always go to the higher production. There are many more ways to remedy a low population, low food city than there are to mend a low production city. The second mistake is believing that loyalty is some sort of deterrent that should prevent you from settling enemy cities. Now, what you need to understand is loyalty a lot of the time is not as bad as you would make it out to be. 
let's do some math. You would get six extra loyalty from putting in a governor, then you would get two extra loyalty from having that governor diplomatic policy thing, and finally, you're going to have another two loyalty for having a garrison in the city with the policy card, not to mention the extra loyalty that unit will give. You add in a monument giving you another loyalty, and just like that, you're up to positive 12 loyalty so a lot of the times if you see a tile with negative seven or negative eight loyalty you could just go ahead settle that city put in a governor and a couple units and you'll have more than enough loyalty to keep that city unless you fall into a dark age and the enemy falls into a golden age but pretty much you just want to take a play out of the ussr's playbook make your policies all about deterring loyalty and freedom from your empire we don't want that when we're playing civilization six if the people want to secede just install military military rule and a puppet governor bro what the hell is this a democracy tell him you better shut up and start building that spaceport before you become the first human rocket ship to go into space all right we're having none of that if you ever need loyalty in all honesty it really isn't the hardest thing to get especially considering civs like the zulu persia and the ottomans do have a lot of extra deterrence i guess for preventing loyalty from being an issue so a lot of the times if you are trying to forward settle a negative four negative five loyalty city you will have so much loyalty pressure by buying monuments governors military units and policies that even in a dark age you should still be able to keep that city and that forward settling will allow you to set st establish a loyalty zone of your own so if the enemy ai decides to put put in a plus one population city near your territory you'll easily be able to snag that considering how stupid the ai is to do all the policies and monuments that i've just listed The next tip is a pretty cool one featuring a mod at the end of it, not planning out everything before you decide to settle that city. There's a reason architects are a thing. You gotta plan. You gotta make every single thing as perfect as possible, or else you're gonna be living in a mud shack in the middle of nowhere where you have to slap on a tree cover and thinking, well, shit. There's nothing better to do, I guess. Now, architects can also be used in Civilization VI. You're the architect. Getting the better map tax mod will allow you to see exactly what yields a district's going to give and allow you to plan out exactly where you're going to put districts and what buildings, if that you can actually put the districts there, if you can actually settle the districts there. It will give you so much information that you will know exactly how good a city is going to be before even settling it. Builders without blueprints are like Steiner's offensive. Not gonna happen. And like what famous General Sun Tzu once said, install the better map tax mod or you done goofed. Now, this mod allows you to see your yields and plan out accordingly for the most part. It isn't perfect, obviously, but what you have to understand is that once you get good at actually planning out the cities, you'll exactly be able to see which district's going to go where and exactly how you are going to plan out the city, what population you're going to get. Can I get an aqueduct? Would it be worth it not to settle a river city? How good is my harbor going to be? These types of things are very, very important for you to know, and honestly, doing that all before you decide to settle that city will save you a pain of trouble when you realize you can't put the dam where you wanted it you can't put the aqueduct where you wanted it the harbor's a plus one gold harbor making it useless and that city is pretty much just a black hole sucking out the amenities from all the other useful cities The fourth mistake a lot of people make is settling on the coast with no river. Now, I don't understand why anyone would want to live on a salty seaboard. After the fifth day of tanning, they'd probably get bored and actually go live somewhere with some fresh drinking water. And that's a problem a lot of the time coastal cities don't have. Coast cities are already at a massive disadvantage. You don't have a lot of production on coast tiles, if any, so you need to be frugal on what to build for the most part, at least until you can get some production up and running. Granaries and aqueducts are necessary in these coastal cities because aside from that, you're not going to get higher than three population. And despite my last tip, you do actually want some population. You need someone to live in your cities to get them to work. But you get those cities on the coast near a river or a lake. Now you're talking. You don't got to build any of that stuff. And you could focus on just building the districts you need for your victory type. Boom. Housing solved for the most part. 
There's no reason to not settle on freshwater coasts. Three housing total is way too limited, and only a couple of districts aren't going to cut it when you need the harbors immediately for some semblance of competence. So, for the most part, even if you have to go a little bit inland, and you're not going to get as good of a harbor as you wanted, just build the harbor. In fact, you'll probably get more production that way by going more inland, and with that, I'd say that's a lot more worth it than missing out on the one or two fishies tile that you are going to by not settling the coast. The last tip is probably the most important one, and that is to always settle as close as possible. Always settle within the city limit. If the city limit is one turn, one tile, settle that city one tile away. Like the Axis powers, sticking together led to Germany declaring war on America to help their buddy Japan, which, uh, I mean... Like the Allied powers, sticking together to help your buddies leads to more organized defenses where you don't have to go on Moses' 40-year march just to get reinforcements to a city. Limiting the amount of ground you have to defend from anybody, you get declared war on and you'll be able to get your entire army dug in, fortified, and forming an impenetrable Viking shield wall about two turns after the declaration, allowing you to stand a much better chance even against technologically superior foes. Not only that, but loyalty is also a non-factor too. If every one of your cities knows if they switch sides, you're just going to all jump them at the same time and keeping them in line, that does prevent a lot of your cities from switching loyalty. The more cities you have, the more pressure you exert, so even in a dark age and everyone else is in a golden age, you'll have just enough loyalty to prevent your cities from switching sides, which gives you a nice headache, because if loyalty gets too low, production takes a cut as well as food production, and you're pretty much just sitting there with an absolutely useless city. Heck, you might as well get it to rebel at that point, considering all the amenities you're losing just trying to keep it happy. But finally, and most importantly, is that districts provide bonuses to nearby districts, kind of like factories providing production to all cities within six tiles, and coal power plants providing power to a lot of cities within six tiles. Not to mention the district adjacency in the early game is the real key to getting ludicrous amounts of yields. You surround an industrial zone with a government plaza, aqueduct, two dams, a couple campuses, and just like that you got that plus 10 production industrial zone ready to absolutely kick ass and build anything you need. Early game, that's going to be a lot of adjacency, and getting 0.5 adjacency per adjacent district might not seem like much, but considering the maximum you can get is an additional plus 3 on top of what you already have, and it's just a wrap at that point. There is no reason not to build those yields. And another thing is, look, locking your cities together gives the barbarians that 2003 Detroit Pistons defense treatment. No room to spawn in or maneuver without getting absolutely spit on by five different cities at once really stops barbarians from even spawning within your empire. No more line infantry barbs in the ancient era because Hammurabi decided to make an appearance and built an armory for shits and giggles.